David went to Nob to Elimelech the priest. Elimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Elimelech the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Then, what have you to hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread to hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's things are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Since there is no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. David asked Elimelech, Don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon, because the king's business was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he feigned it in their presence, and while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman making masks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, Look at the man. He's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? This is the word of God. We shall now join together in hymn number 264. 264. Speak, Lord, in the stillness, while I wait on thee. Thank you. 
It gives me the greatest pleasure to be chairing this meeting uh, for Peter Maiden. He's an old friend of ours. We first got to know him and his wife when we ran young people's squashes uh, in uh, Carlisle about 30, 35 years ago. That perhaps ages us a little bit, Peter. Uh, he came into a living faith, and I think this is lovely, at the age of seven. And then, when he grew up, uh, he went into the car's milling industry at Silleth, and from there moved on and worked in the open-air mission. And uh, following on from that, he had six years as a Bible, uh, uh, teaching the Bible in all kinds of different places, and now is working uh, for the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And it really is lovely to have him with us. Well, thank you very much, Nick. It's a real privilege to be here. I was just thinking, if I was in a squash with Nick 35 years ago, I was five years of age at the time. So it's not quite 35 years, but uh, it's a real pleasure to have Nick as the chairman because both my wife and I do owe a lot to Nick and his wife, Joy, uh, because those squashes played a very important part in our lives as young teenagers. Now, I'd like you to turn to a second passage of Scripture, a very brief one, in 2 Samuel, chapter 11. Second Samuel, chapter 11, and we're going to read the first five verses, and then verses 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. 2 Samuel, I'm sorry. In the spring... At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed this and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Then verse 14, In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. And may God give us understanding of those portions of his word that we've read together. If you go back with me to the first reading, 1 Samuel chapter 21, we see in verse 12, David quite blatantly lying to Ahimelech. And then we read these incredible words, verse 13 of 1 Samuel 21. David feigned insanity in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. I hope you're getting a grip of this in your mind, in your imagination. Here is God's anointed, the man who had tackled the wild animals with his bare hands, the man who had tackled Goliath with a sling and five smooth stones. But what a pathetic picture we have here. And look at Achish deriding him in verse 14. Look at the man. He's insane. Verse 15, am I short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? God's chosen. God's anointed. And then back to 2 Samuel 11. You don't need to turn to it. We've just read the verse. But let me read it to you again. David instructing Joab. Put Uriah, that's the husband of Bathsheba, 
in the front line where the fighting is fiercest and then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. Here is David adding murder to cover his adulterous acts. Again, I remind you, this is God's chosen man, the one whom Acts 13.22 describes as that man after God's heart. And on two occasions, we see him in positions of abysmal, indeed desperate sin and failure. After describing sin in the land of Israel, which resulted in only two who had left Egypt entering the promised land, Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, so if you think you are standing, be careful that you don't fall. In that same chapter, he refers to us, those of us living today, as the people who live in the fulfillment of the ages. What he's saying is this, we have a great privilege living in this particular period of time. And one of our great privileges is that we can learn from people of former ages. We can look back into the Gospels, we can look back into the Old Testament, and we can learn lessons from the way God dealt with his servants in those days. And we can even learn lessons from their failures and from their sins. And I believe Satan's success in bringing God's anointed to his knees in utter defeat should be a warning and a challenge to us all at all times, and maybe particularly this afternoon. But you know, there's encouragement here as well. We know and we shall see soon that by God's gracious intervention, David is brought first to repentance and then to continuing usefulness in the service of his God. It's a marvelous thing, isn't it? Something I've rejoiced in many times in my own life. That sinful failure never needs to be the end in the Christian life. However often Satan might suggest that to us. Sinful failure, terrible falls, never needs to be the end for the man and the woman of God. Now, I don't know in what condition you have come to this convention. I don't know what condition you have come in to this afternoon meeting. Sometimes our condition is very different from what it appears on the outside, isn't it? A few weeks ago... I was preaching at a family conference. There were 30 families, I think, maybe 35 families at this conference. And on the opening evening, I looked out on the congregation, and they were all singing the good hymns and the good modern evangelical songs at the top of their voices, and they were thoroughly enjoying it. And they all looked to be fine Christian families. But you know, by the time we got to the end of that week together, we discovered that at least 10 of those families were going through quite enormous difficulties. Sometimes just an individual in the family going through great personal struggles. But sometimes the very marriage relationship appeared to be almost coming apart at the seams. I don't know who we have in our convention meeting this afternoon, but I'm quite sure that in a congregation of this nature and of this size, there are some with us right now who are grappling with the guilt and the loneliness of sinful defeat. And you may well have been listening, even this morning, to Satan's suggestions that that for you is the end. There's no way forward from here. And I just hope that our little meditation based on David's experiences this afternoon, might be part of your answer to Satan's lies. Well then, how did it all happen? How could such a good man fall so far? Where did it all begin? Back to 1 Samuel 21. 
Look at verse 10. That day David fled. Notice that word. He fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But look at verse 12. On arrival in Gath, he feels no more secure. The servants of Achish recognize him as David, the king of the land, the one sung about in those words, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And so we read, David took these words to heart and the man who had fled is now very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. Something has obviously happened to this man David. Where is that confidence in God of the man who stood alone before Goliath, the man who grappled with wild animals with his bare hands? Fear is replacing trust. His eyes now are fixing on the threatening circumstances by which he is surrounded. His eyes are off the Lord. Faith is beginning to fail. It's Derek Kidner who writes, to have fled from Saul to Gath, of all places. The home of Goliath took nothing less than the courage of despair. But not for long. Praise God, in spiritual warfare, one defeat does not mean the war is lost. I personally love Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8. I'm sure I love them because they're my personal testimony. Paul says to the Corinthians, I'm knocked down, but I'm not destroyed. I like the Living Bible paraphrase of that. I'm often knocked down, but I'm never knocked out. Praise God. That's my testimony so far, and by the grace of God, it will continue to be my testimony. Often knocked down, but by God's grace, not knocked out. Now, if you turn with me to the 56th Psalm, you will see David, who had been knocked down, refusing to stay down, but with God's help, struggling back onto his feet. If you look at the introductory words of that psalm at the beginning, you'll find it was written, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. And I want you to notice this picture of spiritual warfare which David gives to us. A man who has been knocked down, but he's struggling. He refuses to stay down, and by God's grace, gets back onto his feet. Look at where he begins in verse 1. Men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. David seems to be despondent, doesn't he? He seems to be slipping down. But look at verse 3. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? He seems to be struggling back onto his feet, doesn't he? But then look at the following verses. Verse 5. All day long they twist my words and they plot Verse 6, they conspire and lurk, watching my steps, eager to take my life. Apparently, David is slipping down into the slough of despond again. Only in verse 11, to burst forth in confidence and victory. In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And you know, every Christian who seeks to walk with the Lord, will know those ups and downs of spiritual warfare. If we had an overhead projector here this afternoon, and I was to draw the graph of my spiritual life before you, I wonder how it would look. I wonder how yours would look. Would it be a nice, smooth, uninterrupted, upward curve? Please come and see me immediately after the meeting if that would be the graph of your spiritual life. I need to meet you. Actually, I have a special page in my Bible. I'd like you to sign your name on that page. And on the top, you'll find the word hypocrite. 
because it's not like that, is it? It wasn't like that for David. It wasn't like that for Paul. It has not been like that for any man or woman of God seeking to walk with him through this life. Many ups and downs, often knocked down, but by God's grace, never knocked out. But you know, David wrote another psalm at the same time as the psalm we've just looked at. A psalm which should give us great encouragement when you find yourself in the heat of the battle. You might like just to turn back to it. It's the 34th psalm, written again at the same time. Listen to the lessons that David learned in this crisis. Whilst he was going through the problems of 1 Samuel 21, David learned some precious les lessons. Let's look at them. Verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from what? From all my fears. Now here's the man who had fled. The very man who was very much afraid of Achish. But right there in the battle, he found that the Lord answered him and delivered him from all his fears. He says in verse 7, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. David learned to fear God rather than the opposition. It reminds me of that great hymn, Fear him, ye saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. He learned another marvelous lesson in verse 19. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. This is the end of side one. Please turn over now for the continuation on side two.